Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another week here at the Damage Report. I remain, against all odds, John Iderol, and I'm very lucky to, today to be joined, as always, on Mondays by the fantastic Francesca Fiorentini. <laughs> Francesca, how's it going? Good. You realize as soon as I get the vaccine, I'm never doing this again, right? Like, <laughs> just streaking through the streets, partying, like, bye. Miami. Okay, yes, my, well, that's, Miami. Um, I want to eat just a like a face full of tear gas in the Miami streets, just defying any <laughs> curfew to get to Senior Frogs for the margarita specials. <laughs> okay, uh, good. Well, um, so her getting the vaccine makes my life marginally more difficult. We were gonna do a section on one of the more the the vaccines that's coming out. Now I think I'm just gonna mainly do a Tucker Carlson thing for an hour. It's like, why are they pushing it on you? Yes. You get to ask questions, that's what being an American <laughs> is, Francesca. Should you really trust the scientists? We need you, don't go. Uh, so that's gonna no, be I this won't. And that was And that was ironic, cuz uh, you guys don't go anywhere either. I don't care if you got the vaccine, Dragon Squad. Mm -hmm. You stay in the den and you watch your daily damage report, okay? Who's got a den? <laughs> um, the the layer, the dra anyway. where did dragons? Whatever. Oh, that's true. It's that's your lair, nerd crap. Don't drag me in. I'm just trying to play along. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She's gonna be playing D and D by the end, end of the year. Watch. Anyway, uh, thank you everybody for being here, uh, including those of you who have let us know that you've been getting vaccinations. Always great to see those messages. Hope that all of you can soon. Um, but regardless of whether you've been jabbed or not, thank you for being here. Please hit the like button and share the stream so that more people know we're active as we go through an hour of news that will include such hits as what's going on at the border. What's not going on at the border, but Fox briefly wants you to think is going on at the border to make things more spicy. Uh, what's going on with the pandemic? Uh, what's going on with the war in Iraq over the past 18 years? And uh, Ken, Klippenstein, Ken Klippenstein strikes again. I love the name of this block, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, Ken, he swings a lot and the, the dude never misses. This is a hilarious one that you're gonna wanna stick around to see. And uh, as we go through, if you have comments, thoughts, anything like that, feel free to let us know. I will also let you know, Following the show, as always on Mondays, Francesca and I will be recording one of our top 10 lists for our tier two and tier three YouTube members. This week, it's top 10 things that I'd love for you to please shut up about. So <laughs> things that we just don't want to hear about ever again. And if you have been watching the show for a while, I think you could probably guess one or two, but I'm hoping to surprise you. So that'll be coming up very soon. But before that, and I just realized my done thing actually isn't marked for the A block. Anyway, uh, Francesca, are you <laughs> ready to do this? I think so, yeah. Okay, let's see what's going on then. The situation at the border is getting worse, although not necessarily in the way the media either thinks or at the very least wants you to think. Because this entire weekend of mainstream media was just Biden's crisis at the border. Or if you're on Fox News, why isn't Biden calling it a crisis at the border? Now the thing is, there is a crisis, but not necessarily the crisis that they're focusing on. The crisis that actually exists is the current situation that thousands of unaccompanied minors are being held in. And reports emerged over the weekend that the Biden administration has at least 15,500 unaccompanied minors in custody, over 10,000 in the HHS, and 5,000 being held by US Customs and Border Patrol, who I wouldn't want to hold, you know, Ugh. one to five kids, let alone 5,000. They're currently being housed in emergency shelters and facilities licensed for child care, while the roughly 5,000 children being held by CBP are being kept in crowded jail like facilities according to a CNN report. And to give you an idea of what this looks like, here is a photo from Donna, Texas of one of them. Now take a look at this and what does that remind you of? Exactly all of the photos minus a bit of chain link from the Trump years. Now that is not all of the kids and teenagers, but it is a significant chunk of them. And I would say that 5,000 counts, 500 would count, 50 would count, 5,000 definitely counts, uh, Francesca. So. That I think is the thing that needs to be focused on. That as of right now, thousands of kids are being held in conditions like that for longer than they're supposed to legally. For at least they're supposed to be there for no more than 72 hours. Some are being held there for five days a week or longer. That is the actual crisis, I think. Absolutely, yeah, I mean, it's a mess. It is legitimately a mess. And honestly, I think it's fair to say that we have a broken immigration system. Hey, 
fun when you just let you know um, political partisan hackery uh, become more important than actually solving a humanitarian crisis. And when you give a bunch of money to militarism, but no money to like actual humanitarian services, you know, like facilities that could actually house unaccompanied migrants um, that are you know not. A concrete floor. Um, that that of mm-hmm. course this is the crisis that has happened, and it didn't just happen under Trump, right? These are years and years uh, uh, in the making, and and years and years of a strategy of deterrence, which is basically make it as awful as possible to try and immigrate, and once you get to the United States, make it as awful as possible to be here that nobody wants to come anymore. But of course, this is um, this is happens every single year. Um, this is before the summertime, it is much hotter to, to immigrate and on foot in the summer, in the dead of summer, that's where a, a lot of deaths occur. So it makes sense, this is not anything new. There is, it, there, it surges around this time. The question is, can we actually house people in more humane conditions? And definitely, I wouldn't, like I would take away customs and border patrols like own kids. I'm sorry. <laughs> if they've got kids, maybe we need to call in on them. I'm not I'm obviously joking, but not really. Um so it is a mess. We need to actually tackle it more um you know, sort of more holistically. But yeah, it's it's awful to see this no matter who is is president. Exactly. Yeah. And uh it's important that we call it out no matter who is president. We've been trying to do that. Now now you might think um well, uh you you were saying after all for weeks now that you want the media to talk about this. Uh we do. We're going to show you what the media and politicians paying attention to this actually looks like. What we want, I will just speak for myself is uh, get the kids off the concrete floor and get them into places where they're not likely to be uh, both traumatized inherently by the experience, let alone victimized by the people that are supposed to be protecting them. Um, and the thing is, look, as we said last time with Biden, I don't think that this is the product of Stephen Miller like hatching a plan in his volcano lair to inflict as much human suffering and as possible. But human suffering is being inflicted, and e- even if Biden has better motives. More resources need to be put into moving these kids as fast as possible. And I understand all of the excuses about all of a sudden the number spiked or it's a pandemic. So we can't hold as many people in certain facilities. Okay, well, you are the US government. We're supposed to be able to rely on you if a hurricane hits, okay? Sometimes people need to be moved and they need to be kept in places that are humane. If this is the best you can do with virtually unlimited resources, that is a massive problem. So we are allowed to expect more, we should expect more. That is the actual thing that we should be focusing on. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Now, what does it look like when the media and right wingers get to determine what the crisis at the border actually looks like? Well, it comes in a couple different forms. Here's a tweet from Senator John Cornyn. This is Texas Center. President Biden has instead emphasized the humane treatment of immigrants, regardless of their legal status, rather than stopping illegal immigration. So his whole point, what he <laughs> added to a previous tweet was, Biden's too focused on humane treatment of immigrants. 
Okay, so they're going to be getting all of their followers whipped into a frenzy of it's not enough that we're talking about the border or want to do something. It's why are we wasting our time treating these people as if they were humans, which we all get, of course, that they're not. And not everybody's going to be as explicit as. John Cornyn, but some are gonna, like people who we've given a little bit of credit on on some issues are gonna interject things like Mitt Romney who says, the Biden administration's lack of understanding of the power of incentives continues to baffle me. Allowing unaccompanied minors to stay in the US will yield a flood of unaccompanied minors. It's a de facto child separation policy. Okay, that seems clever to him, I'm sure. I don't understand what he thinks the alternative is other than guns at the border, building a wall quickly, something that he in the past has never seemed too hot for. Now with Biden, it's well, how dare you not throw these kids back over the border? So yeah. people are focusing on it, Francesca. But I worry that as with Trump, the end result of the media and right wingers is going to be, why isn't Biden being more cruel? Why isn't he having you know harsher penalties? Throw them away, stop it by whatever means necessary. Yeah, I mean, it is that is a political line that is absolutely 100% okay with death, right? Like, that's the alternative. The alternative to not accepting unaccompanied minors, to house them in as humane conditions as you can, right? Um, which they're not doing, as, as we talked about. But the alternative is death. The alternative is allow them to be victimized, allow them to be trafficked, allow them. I mean, you talk about a, a right wing party and nut jobs who care about, you know, like, child trafficking, yeah. So let's talk about what happens when unaccompanied minors aren't a given asylum, when they aren't allowed to be united with any family members that they have in the United States. Yeah, that's actual child trafficking, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about coyotes. Um, so it is, it's, it's really important to understand that the alternative here again is death. So at, at one point, right? It's a complicated issue. We don't have all the solutions. A lot of it has to do with assisting countries, you know, working on anti-poverty campaigns. That is mm -hmm. laced with its own problems, given the United States' track record in you know countries in Central America. But at the end of the day, you're face to face with a question of, do you believe people should die or not? That's it. Life or death, yes or no. And if mm -hmm. the answer is no, then you're gonna have to be okay with Immigrants coming to this country because guess what? They're not violent criminals. They make this country better. And oh my God, do they do a whole lot of labor that they should be better paid for? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now, what does it look like when the media and right wingers get to determine what the crisis at the border actually looks like? Well, it comes in a couple different forms. Here's a tweet from Senator John Cornyn. This is Texas Center. President Biden has instead emphasized the humane treatment of immigrants, regardless of their legal status, rather than stopping illegal immigration. So his whole point, what he <laughs> added to a previous tweet was, Biden's too focused on humane treatment of immigrants. Okay, so they're going to be getting all of their followers whipped into a frenzy of, it's not enough that we're talking about the border or want to do something, it's why are we wasting our time treating these people as if they were humans, which we all get, of course, that they're not. And not everybody is going to be as explicit as John Cornyn, but some are going to, like people who we've given a little bit of credit on on some issues, are going to interject things like Mitt Romney, who says, the Biden administration's lack of understanding of the power of incentives continues to baffle me. Allowing unaccompanied minors to stay in the US will yield a flood of unaccompanied minors. It's a de facto child separation policy. Okay, that seems clever to him, I'm sure. I don't understand what he thinks the alternative is other than guns at the border, building a wall quickly, something that he in the past has never seemed too hot for. Now with Biden, it's well, how dare you not throw these kids back over the border? So yeah. people are focusing on it, Francesca. But I worry that as with Trump, the end result of the media and right wingers is going to be, why isn't Biden being more cruel? Why isn't he having you know harsher penalties, throw them away, stop it by whatever means necessary? Yeah, I mean, it is that is a political line that is absolutely 100% okay with death, 
right? Like that's the alternative. The alternative to not accepting unaccompanied minors to house them in as humane conditions as you can, right? Um, which they're not doing as, as we talked about. But the alternative is death. The alternative is allow them to be victimized, allow them to be trafficked, allow them. I mean, you talk about a, a right wing party and nut jobs who care about, you know, like child trafficking. Yeah. So let's talk about what happens when unaccompanied minors aren't a given asylum, when they aren't allowed to be united with any family members that they have in the United States. Yeah, that's actual child trafficking, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about coyotes. Um, so it is, it's, it's really important to understand that the alternative here again is death. So at, at one point, right? It's a complicated issue. We don't have all the solutions. A lot of it has to do with assisting countries you know, working on anti-poverty campaigns that is mm -hmm. laced with its own problems, given the United States' track record in you know countries in Central America. But at the end of the day, you're face to face with a question of, do you believe people should die or not? That's it, life or death, yes or no. And if mm -hmm. the answer is no, then you're gonna have to be okay with immigrants coming to this country. Because guess what, they're not violent criminals. They make this country better, and oh my God, do they do a whole lot of labor that they should be better paid for? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Governor Greg Abbott is going to do what a lot of these Republicans are going to do. He's going to opportunistically use the fact that immigrants exist for some goal. Some of them, it's just a bludgeon to hit Biden over the head with when. He deserves to be hit over the head, but in a productive fashion. Um, some are going to use it to justify things that they have done. So let's let's take a look at what Greg Abbott had to say, and then I'll explain what I mean with that last part. And now the Biden administration is importing COVID into the state of Texas, yeah. exposing more Texans to that. And who knows on what we're going to see, whether or not there will be uh, an explosion of COVID in the locations uh, where the Biden administration is putting these migrants. Okay, <laughs> so. Uh, do you see what's happening there, Francesca? Oh, bless his little black heart. Oh my God, Governor Greg Abbott, UPOS, how dare you? You're the, mm -hmm. the same guy who just dropped all mask mandates and said every business and anywhere should be open, open, open when Texas has every single variant of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Ugh, go away forever. Oh my gosh, choke on yeah. your spit. Yeah, so it would be like, it it would be one thing if it was just hypocritical. It's like, wait, so is COVID a big threat or not? Is it an issue or is it just, eh, you gotta live with it? Because you're governing as if, eh, I guess it would be better if we didn't have respiratory infections, but I'm not gonna stop you know, a, a hair salon from opening up over that. Um, and then now when it's these people, supposedly that's the big issue, but it's almost worse because it's not just an inconsistency between those two positions. It's a direct link between those two. He to me is telegraphing that he thinks there's going to be a rise in COVID rates. The important thing to him is not stopping that, it's not saving lives. It's making sure that he wins the PR battle so that someday Politico can do an article about how he won the pandemic or whatever. <laughs> uh, they're gonna have the rise. But don't get mad at him. It's not that he's telling everyone to not do common sense measures to not get an infection. It's well, somewhere else there's immigrants and that caused it. Even though as people are pointing out in the chat, many of these immigrants are coming from areas of the world that actually as of right now have lower COVID rates than where they're entering into. For him, it is an opportunistic thing to be able to say it wasn't me opening things up. It was those damn immigrants. As always, they will be used as a scapegoat for the actions of the US government, or in this case, the Texas government. Yes, it is It is 100% because they're from Latin America, they're Mexican, Guatemalan, Salvadoran, wherever they're coming from. Because yeah, if we cared about COVID, and I've been saying this since the beginning, man, John, it's been a long time, but yep. I don't want cross state travel. Stop the immigrants coming from Florida. Stop the immigrants coming <laughs> into Florida from elsewhere, partying on Miami Beach and spreading COVID. I'm sorry, like I don't want, I want to stop this virus from spreading. We could have prevented so many deaths and we can still prevent deaths if we actually stop the migration happening within these COVID infected states. 
But no, 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 that's against freedom. And of course, I'm wrong. But no, 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 let's take away all of the freedoms and, and all of the human rights from people trying to get to this country to have minimally a better life. What does that tell you? Oh, yeah, let me, I'm going to immigrate just into the belly of the COVID beast, you mm-hmm. know? And once yeah. again, the, the eternal, you know, uh, no parent would put their child into a boat unless the boat was safer than dry land. When it comes to talking about migration and the reasons that people move, it is because it is dangerous and, and deadly where they are coming from. Yeah. In theory, if you wanted to demonstrate um, the actual issues at the border, you could do what you know we're seeing with these photos being spread. Look at these, these are inhumane conditions for people to be held in. Let's do something about that. Now for Fox, that's something maybe they'll dabble in to perhaps point out that for some centrist liberals, and this is true, they are not bothered by it now and were under Trump. You should be consistent, if it was bad, then it's still bad. But you also don't wanna focus on how that's a bad thing because their audience doesn't think it's a bad thing. So that's an issue. So they are looking for drama and how that manifests itself can be pretty comical. Sometimes in real time, earlier today on Fox with host Harris Faulkner. Harris Faulkner reported that the DHS secretary had stepped down. And then about three seconds later said, hold on a second. I imagine at that point was being furiously yelled at in her earpiece and then had to report that that had not actually happened. Now. <gasps> What was communicated to her that caused her to say with total confidence that a person had stepped down that hadn't? I don't know, but she did say it and then had to immediately correct it. Although after Donald Trump, who was calling in, got to say that's awesome and not surprising, this thing that had not actually happened. Now, as she later pointed out in the video that you saw, he's calling for the DHS secretary to step down. But what what does he actually know about that person or what they're doing or what they haven't done? It's just. It's just drama and they found a way to have it be infused with less substance than it might have otherwise been. They're just speculating now about people stepping down with no actual evidence of that. I got confused in all that, John, but yep. I trust you and I, I think you're great. That's my fault. And <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's my, my it's my fault. Um, I want to jump ahead to just a little bit more. Let's Let's take a look at this. Before I let you go, just real quickly. Most presidents, ex-presidents like yourself do not weigh in at this level. Why did you feel like you needed to on this issue? Well, you called me, I didn't call you in all fairness, but- I just love that as a moment. So you have Donald yeah. Trump who is who is calling into the show. <laughs> She's pointing out that normally ex-presidents, especially immediately after they're out of office, don't involve themselves in issues. In fact, Fox would use that during the Trump years to get politicians like the, like Obama to back off, even though Obama was very hands off during the Trump years. Here, she's sort of pitching it as a good thing, but he he doesn't even understand what part he's supposed to play in this. Saying you called me, well, she later pointed out, dude posted a statement about this individual calling for him to step down. So it's really weird for you to like imply that you didn't want to be on the news. What did they hack into your phone? You're engaged in this, you want to be, that's the whole thing. You called me, I didn't call you. Like, why are you doing a power move right now, bro? You don't need to do that. <laughs> like, that's so- Rearranging the furniture. Yeah, it's so weird. But God, you really bring up a good point on this. And it's it's something that we, because everything moved so fast in the last four years, we haven't had a time to catch our breaths and look back. And yeah, the ways that Obama was absolutely hands off. Um, you know, the Republican Party and Trumpists started calling Democrats the opposition party time and time again. And, you know, I wish, right? Like, I wish that we had an opposition party. I wish that Democrats actually stepped up to Trump. They eventually started to, not without a whole slew of progressive Democrats having to run and primary establishment Dems not doing anything in 2018. Then they started to understand, Oh gosh, we're supposed to fight like this encroaching fascist, you know, wannabe dictator president. Yeah, man. But then you have Trump who's like automatically, yes, you know, once again, obliterating all norms and he's gonna be winning and scoring political points for doing so by trying to carry the torch of his political project. If Obama had carried the torch of the political project, he would have openly spoke out and like held rallies and talked about how this is not our country. Our country, you we might have voted for this guy. There might have been a lot of shenanigans in getting him into office. But we don't stand for this. We don't stand for this kind of rhetoric and this kind of politics. 
but he yeah. didn't. He didn't. Could have helped. He, I guess he's got a podcast. I mean, yay. And he occasionally uh, put out a statement that would be like, okay, or whatever. But yeah, no, not he occasionally time. would do a little something. And then of course, the press would be like, oh, I think he's talking about Trump. And it's like, yeah. no, may, I, of course, you know. But well, yeah, and also, it, it should just, we have to, like, is the best you can do a subtweet in speech <laughs> form? Is that is that the best you can do? We're in this weird time in American culture where everything is being remade. Now, I'm not always opposed to this. I just found out that in like a couple of days, a new TV show of the Mighty Ducks is coming out. Did you know this? I love the Mighty Ducks growing up. There's a new series with Emilio Estevez, which is coming out. Everything is getting rebooted, including what you're about to see. Because Trump has something to say about the current state of the border that almost certainly if he does launch a social media thing, which we're gonna talk about, run for office again, this is what he's gonna be running on. I want you to listen to this video and you tell me if it reminds you of anything. Bringing the violence to our country because many of the people coming are not nonviolent people, they're violent people, many of the people coming. Uh, these countries don't send out their finest and in some cases I'm sure you have wonderful fine people, but you also have criminals, you have uh, murderers, you have uh, sex traffickers. You have a lot of very bad people coming into our country. I mean, they're not sending their best. They're sending murders. They're set, hey, he mixed it up. It's sex traffickers rather than rapists. Because sex traffickers, that gets the Q people more riled up than the concept of rape. After all, they're very defensive about basically everybody who gets accused of rape. So let's move the rape to the side and focus on the sex traffickers. Yes. That's just like when he called but, but in to Harris level, Walker, or technically not, she no called one. him. No billionaires, yeah, no, no sex traffickers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, obviously, they're, they're just the no. low level sex. Low tra- level, <laughs> and and keep it vague. No specifics. I don't want anyone to go to jail. But the concept bothers me. Anyway, <laughs> like so. Apparently, Harris Faulkner called him. Was he going down the escalator while she called him? Because that was just his campaign launch speech again, almost word for word at that point. Yeah, that he like I I mean he didn't do it right. Either like if you're gonna do the hits, play the hits. But mm-hmm. yes, it's very much like what what was it? Was it quack or flap? They go flap, flap, flap. It's is it quack? Is it quack or flap? Quack. It's, it's quack. quack. <laughs> Frances. Flap, flap, flap. That doesn't get kids. Flap makes more up, sense. Man. Flap makes more sense. No, they quack. quack. They're ducks. Quack is very stupid. It should have been flap, flap, flap. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in the reboot, that's what it'll be. Anyway, was there a point you wanted to make, or do you just want to offend me deeply? <laughs> yeah, the point was is that it felt like he was doing that, like he was like the uh-huh. reboot. You could hear it coming, you know. Yeah, the chance, I, I, the, the chance audience, of flap. <laughs> I think the audience is probably very happy with it. Anyway, um, okay, so as we have been for weeks, we're going to keep an eye on the situation. The numbers there are getting higher and higher. They've now had like okay. From one day to the next, you can't necessarily process thousands of kids, but you have had literally weeks. You have an agency that has received, like in the 90s, they were getting a crazy amount of money. And every year since then, they've gotten more and more money. The fact that they can't adapt to humans existing, that doesn't seem like a challenge that should be on their capabilities. But apparently, as of right now, it is. We now have several vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer and J and J being distributed across the United States. Could there be another one coming? Well, you've probably heard a lot of conversation about the AstraZeneca vaccine, especially concerns about side effects, including blood clots. There's been all of this news flying back and forth. Now, supposedly, their most recent big trial has been concluded, and they have some good information coming from that. AstraZeneca and the University of Oxford provided strong protection against COVID-19 in a large clinical trial in the US, completely preventing the worst outcomes from the disease while causing no serious side effects. In a statement, AstraZeneca said its COVID-19 vaccine was 79% effective at preventing symptomatic COVID-19 and 100% effective in stopping severe disease and hospitalizations, similar to the ones that have already been FDA approved. Though it hasn't yet published its full data, so it's unclear if there were enough severe cases to make that finding significant. Investigators said the vaccine worked across adults of all ages, including older people, something that experts wanted better data on coming out of previous trials. So they are obviously not happy with the you know the blood clot stuff that's been going around as a result of this. And it included a ton of people. It's like 
47,000 people were involved in the trial. They're saying that it is safe. Of course, this is coming out from them and their data is not yet available. So they're, it's not being distributed, it hasn't yet been approved in the US. And honestly, at this point, according to what I am reading, even if it did get authorization for emergency use, by the time they would actually be able to distribute it, we would be off into May when federal officials predict that the three current manufacturers that have already been authorized will be producing enough doses for all of the nation's adults, especially considering that conservatives don't wanna take it. So I know that this is getting people concerned, um, but it might kind of be a moot point. My fear is more that it might lead people not to take non AstraZeneca vaccines that if they're hearing about blood clots, they might think, um, well, whether that's true of AstraZeneca or not, maybe it's true of the others. And so that's the main reason I want to cover this, Francesca. My fear that like the, the bad information that might not even be accurate about a vaccine that's not even available might poison the well for the ones that are apparently uh, confirmed to be safe. Yeah, it's almost like. We should just have one formula that works and that mm -hmm. big pharma should take a seat and stop raking in billions and billions of dollars of profit and you know lording over their own patents and not sharing mm -hmm. them with anyone. And we should all just produce the most effective vaccine. But <laughs> who am I but a mere earth dwelling dreamer? Um, <laughs> yes, this is. It's not good to, to foment like uh, mistrust in a vaccine, especially one that actually like there isn't good stats on whether or not it's causing more or fewer blood clots than normal, than what no people normally have. And I also think, look, we're gonna learn a lot about this, uh, this, this, this virus as we go on, um, as we study it even further, because there have been you know, it, it it does a number on your cardiovascular system, right? Like it 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 your and your your circular system, um, not just your the lungs and respiratory, but but like like it compounds. There's been more strokes and things like this, mm -hmm. um, and that's something to study. That's something interesting. So we don't know. We don't know whether whether these issues were already in the general public or not, or whether it was caused by this vaccine. But you know, I know that, for example, I think it's Australia that is getting access to the AstraZeneca vaccine. Australia, which has done a phenomenal job in containing the virus, in stopping yeah. the spread of it. And I would like for Australians to get access to this vaccine and to and to use it, right? And and so once again, we in the United States, who have done arguably the worst job of many, many countries that have been hit with COVID, are now getting the best of the best. And hey, mm -hmm. if you're if you're going to be a hegemon, you know, have have some benefits. If you're going to be an empire, I guess this is the benefit, although according to the right, it's the country is in decay, but yet we still mm -hmm. remain on top. Yeah. Yeah. And it's almost the way that we're approaching the the vaccine with us getting it first and then even Biden um saying, "Well, you know, someday once we're all vaccinated, we may, you know, charitably give some to other countries." is sort of like it's the way conservatives approach America writ large across the world. They seem perfectly happy to have a few people safe in their, you know, uh, gated communities surrounded by poverty and disease and lawlessness, if that's what it takes for them to feel safe. We're producing that by not forcing the, the patent to be made available or getting out in front of the fact that, you know, like maybe we can start shipping some vaccines to other countries even now. Other countries are doing it. Um, anyway, that's something that we've talked about multiple times. I want to give everyone an update though on the current status of the pandemic. Data has been a little bit less reliable from my point of view in that there used to be great uh, daily reports put together by the COVID tracking project. Uh, and I got very used to the way they presented that. There is still information though. And so I want to at least in broad strokes give an idea of how things look because there is some good news, although not exclusively good news. So if you take a look um, at the country at large, as of yesterday, new cases were down to 34,000, which is a 7% decline over the past two weeks. So that is good. It's certainly better than the 200,000 plus we had during the dark winter. It is still a lot of COVID that is going around though. And when you bear in mind that some of that is going to be the more infectious kind, 
um, and that that is spreading rapidly. These numbers again could be you know, uh, affected by the fact that in two weeks it's gonna be very different. We don't know, we need to continue to look. New deaths are down to 444 on the 21st. Again, these are Sunday numbers, and so these are always lower than the days around them. It is possible that a 440 death Sunday could result in a 900 death Wednesday, we have mm -hmm. to see. But that is a significant decline from two Sundays previous. So this is this is good news and it needs to be noted. Now we have seen drops like this before though, Francesca, uh. before, Thanksgiving, we had gotten down to 500 to 1000 deaths per day. So um, as has been noted, we are sort of watching a race right now between vaccination and the spread of the new more infectious variants of COVID. Now on top of that, you could have layered continued social responsibility, social distancing, masking and all of that. Based on what I'm seeing around the country, I think we're pretty much done with that. It is pretty much vaccinations and a few responsible libs. That's basically it. And so that broad strokes is how the pandemic looks. How do you feel about it? Bad. Mm -hmm. I it's will less than it was in January. I'll counter your very articulate summary into feeling bad. Yeah, I mean, Yes, I am I am a little hopeful that, you know, hopefully because of the amount of people being vaccine uh, getting the vaccine will vaccinated. I don't know. We will eventually get to whatever herd immunity. Um I uh, I don't I don't yeah, know. It's, it's going to take a, it's taking a while and I don't know, but look, Joe Biden told me that on July 4th I could grill outdoors with my friends and family and mm -hmm. God damn it, I'm gonna try and get there and do that. Yeah, and that is depending on who you are, either an inspiration that if we are responsible by then we might be largely past this or it can frustrate you so much as a conservative that you like boycott grilling to stick it to them. I don't know, that's apparently what they're gonna do. Now in terms of overall vaccination progress, the US has fully vaccinated 13% of the population, which is you know, after three months, not the best. But <laughs> ideally that is the 13% who were of those who can be vaccinated. And of course not everyone can, those who are most at risk. So fully vaccinating 13% of the population could in theory cut down more than 13% of the deaths, at least expected. A quarter of the country has received one dose and we are seeing a rapid acceleration of the number that are being vaccinated per day. And as you know, I think we talked about last week, the initial goal of having 100 million vaccinated under the Biden administration in the first 100 days, they reached that almost twice as fast as they expected. We're shooting past 2 million vaccinations per day. This is all good. However, again, I want to put this in the context of the rest of the world. So if you zoom out and take a look at vaccination rates for the different countries, the US is doing pretty well. There are some countries that have done better. Israel, you know, notably a lot of people have recognized is, has done more than 50% of their population. You see other countries including Turkey, Chile, the UK, who've done a lot of vaccinations. There are huge regions of the world though that have done far, far, far less, less yeah. than a quarter as much as we have. And that can be chalked up to a number of different explanations, including some cases of government incompetence, a better explanation generally though is when you can't get the vaccine, it's hard to administer it. When you literally can't buy it, even if you have the money, it's gonna be hard to vaccinate your people. Yeah. And so the progress is not equal around the world and that is having an effect. So you, you saw the numbers of COVID cases in the US, they're going down, right? Isn't that great? Worldwide, not so much. Take a look at this, the daily cases around the world are rising significantly around the world. 22% over the past two weeks while deaths remain flat. But if cases are going up, then in two weeks, one would expect that the deaths would no longer be flat every two weeks over two weeks. Then so this is a, we're doing better. No, and first of all, I have so much to say, but the first story about the border crisis and this story are absolutely related in the exact opposite way that Republicans want it to be related. These are the same outlets that you know throw doubt on the vaccine that are then turning around saying that immigrants are bringing COVID into uh, the United States. Well, that might actually happen if we don't do more to be able to allow other countries to get the vaccine. And more importantly than get the vaccine, to manufacture the vaccine, which is yeah. why the World Trade Organization needs to drop the patent protections yeah. in this case. And in all cases when it comes to human health, right? But that doesn't that doesn't happen. It hasn't happened with even things like um HIV meds, which actually like I've said this before on the show, but like the Clinton Foundation has done a good job of like getting like, you know, not off brand. 
you know, or like manufacturing HIV medicine. Um, but but this has to happen now. These are not countries that don't have production capacity. They yeah. do. They just don't have the patents and the formulas. Give them the patents and the formulas. It's what the World Health Organization is calling for. It's what nations around the world are calling for. But once again, we want to move toward a xenophobic children of men future, where we, you know, just build higher walls and keep anyone yeah. out, and you know, make an excuse for more authoritarianism. So yeah. we have a choice, y'all. And and I think the other thing I'll just say is that. The vaccine cannot be your plan for these kinds of of viruses. Vaccines cannot, they're not a good plan. Like they're just, it's great after a year and you can get it, it's too slow. So I hope that the Biden administration is investing in contact tracing, isolation, quarantine, and all of the infrastructural ways that places like South Korea um, or Taiwan, which has like no COVID, um, has done an immaculate job at actually stopping the spread because of their previous experience with things like SARS. So let's make sure we beef that up as we move into this hopefully post pandemic or post COVID-19 future with definitely more pandemics to come down the road. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, um, and I actually watched Children of Men recently, so I get that reference. Um, <laughs> yeah, even if, let's say hypothetically, the only, like you were willing to do nice things, but only because it benefited yourself. Um, many of the formulas for these vaccines uh, were created many months ago, long before they were actually approved. That's how they were able to test them. In theory, and and much was produced on the assumption that it would make it through, which is why initially we had so many supplies. In theory, even if you were a cold hearted bastard internationally, you could have made these available for many, many countries to start pumping out vaccine and say, we get a quarter of what you produce in exchange right? for you getting free access to it. We could have done that. Like we could have been dicks and benefited more than we actually did. Yep. Uh, yeah. Donald Trump has been languishing in mostly silence for the past few months, even though he's recently figured out that he can release tweets as press releases, sort of. Um, but he, we've expected that he's going to return at some point because the dude is like Tinkerbell in that he will die if you don't clap for him. So uh, what will that look like? Well, uh, his spokesperson to some extent, Jason Miller was recently on Fox News and this is what he had to say about it. You know, Harry, this is really interesting. The fact that the president's been off of social media for a while because his press releases, his statements have actually been getting almost more play than he ever did on Twitter before. I'm not sure if that's because the length of them were a bit longer. I even had one reporter say that she thought it was much more elegant the way that the president was able to communicate his thoughts and it very much looked more presidential in that long form. But uh, I do think that we're going to see President Trump returning to social media in probably about two or three months here with his own platform. And this is something that I think will be the, the hottest ticket in social media. It's going to completely redefine the game and everybody is going to be waiting and watching to see what exactly President uh, Trump does, but it will be his own platform. Shut up, you stupid idiot. It's going to redefine the game. It's going to be Twitter. That's what it's going to be, basically. No. And it's no, what's it what if be? it's an app? I really want it to be an app. I uh -huh. want him to roll out his own app that just like is buggy and crashes <laughs> and that like no one uses and it like gives you a free game if you like all download it. Um, <laughs> I just I just want it to be like Quibi, you know, <laughs> but for Trump. Yeah. I want I want. Uh, yeah, it'll be like, will it be like Trumpy or, you know, like Trumpy, Quibby, T R U M P I, like something? He's going to hire all those people. It's going to fail. Mm -hmm. uh, right wingers are going to get like, you know, a whole bunch of deals, probably some of my comedian friends, just because we're desperate to. Um, <laughs> it's, I'm very excited. Uh, no, I'm not excited. It obviously. is. It, I, so if he makes this app, it'll be buggy, obviously. Will there be any information about you that it doesn't steal? <laughs> or like release, like people, it'll be the most hackable. The scandals that will come out of this, if it's an app, or more foundationally, if it happens, because you might think, well, wait, it's gonna happen. He just said it. <laughs> Does that mean it's gonna happen, honestly? He's gonna create his own social media platform. Maybe he will. He has money. 
I guess. He could have just bought Parlor. They like they were gonna give him a significant chunk for him to switch over. He, he has enough money to money. make an app, I guess. Enough money to make an yes, enough money to yes. pay someone who like code took a like a boot camp coding summer thing, yeah. and they're gonna, they're gonna roll it out. It's um, just gonna be. By the way, I wanted to give credit to Parker Malloy who pointed out that um, the app doesn't exist, but we do have. Uh, the website for it. It is available right now at www.creedthoughts.gov.www backslash creedthoughts if you watch The Office. Anyway, um, is it just gonna be a Word document that he writes in? I don't know, stay tuned to find out. But um, more importantly, <laughs> I think- Google Docs. <laughs> it's gonna be Google Docs. It's um, more importantly, a shared Google Doc we all get not access gonna work. to. Uh, are people really gonna switch over? Just to see what Donald Trump has to say, and I by regular people maybe, but like all of the people who've gotten like deals with Parler to be there, or what are they going to switch over? And then like what about like Gab or Parler, which they've pitched themselves as the place for those people? Well, they're not going to be happy about this, by the way. So are you going to further segment the already fractious band of weirdo apps that? Are like, hey, we're the ones that are cool with Nazis. I know, the whole thing just seems like a massive mess. And behind the scenes, um, you know, there's a bunch of places where like Trump fans still congregate. They don't even really seem that excited about this. Like some of the Q people are like, hey, wait, isn't he supposed to be fighting Satan? Why is he making an app? That's a good question, actually, considering your worldview. Why is he spending his time on this? But um, anyway, yeah, I yeah, don't. These are people I don't who know think Facebook. Yeah, no, they, they they think Facebook is the internet. Like they're not, they don't know how to get to the app store to download that a new app. Then they certainly are not gonna download a Trump app. It's like they just figured out how to like post a React GIF on Facebook and mm -hmm. like do the big font, you know, and like, like create an event. And look, the way Facebook <laughs> is going, I would not be surprised if they let Trump back on. I, in fact, I will bet you that that Mark yeah. Zuckerberg will let Trump back on, absolutely. What, Twitter too or just just Mark Zuckerberg? No, 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 I think Zuckerberg will. I don't know about- mm, um, That's a good bet. About Peter Dinklage, what's his name? Um, Jack, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I doubt Twitter will be able to, but I I could see Facebook doing it. It's Mark Facebook Zuckerberg, there's yes. no, like oh, there's oh. nowhere he could go. <laughs> <laughs> That's too deep for him. Anyway, um, I have other thoughts, but I, I honestly, I'm gonna keep it real. I don't care about my thoughts about this. <laughs> we'll see what happens. I don't care. Let's move on. <laughs> yeah, he'll probably be around, or more generally than he'll be around, the world will be worse. You can, you can bet your ass on that. Just a couple of days ago, we hit the 18th anniversary of the war in Iraq. Eight. 18 years, Francesca. And we've got a lot of stuff that we want to say about it. Numbers about how devastating it's been and everything. But um, I mean, 18 years. It, it almost goes back for me to the beginning of me getting politi politically conscious. I've been paying attention to politics for like two years at that point. Um, but 18 years and still ongoing, still chaotic, still violent. Did you? Did you think at the time that there was any chance that we'd be hitting almost the two decade point that you could legally have sex with the war in Iraq? Is, is that, did you ever think that that's what would happen? That was my tweet, was it, you know, yeah. the war in Iraq turned 18, but it's still illegal, um, <laughs> which it, it is, it is, it was illegal. And, and you know, the, my first thought, I think, I think it's a little bit like a 9-11 thought. It's a little, where were you when Trump was elected? Um, I do remember when bombs started falling on Baghdad after I was uh, you know, working in the anti-war movement, was very politicized by 9-11, by you know, the, the ramp up to the war in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and you know, it we still have troops in Iraq, right? And, and in part to try and mitigate all of the blowback that happens when we do pig headed things like invading countries and trying to save people from their own dictators who we propped up for decades and decades and sold all the weapons that they then used against their own yeah. people, I'm talking about Saddam Hussein. So 
it it is we still have troops there it's still important not to forget i mean i'm i am think it's more important we figure out how to draw down the war in afghanistan right now and get out of the middle east altogether but i feel old i feel seasoned i feel like um as bad and i think it's hard for young people to remember this as bad as drone strikes are, they're bad. We do not need them. They are not a good way to solve problems. Um, I think that there was a shift because of how many people around the world came out against this war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan. There was a, a, a marked shift um, in the United States from we should invade everywhere, we can invade everywhere to no, 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 this is a bad idea. And maybe we'll do these little strikes here and there. So mm -hmm. it's a it's a bad victory, meaning it doesn't make things that much better. But not putting boots on the ground, having that be so politically toxic, even to Republicans and especially to Republicans. Marjorie Taylor Greene says some crazy things, but she was against or she says now that she's against the war in Iraq. That we shouldn't go invade countries. That's a victory, guys. That's like an important thing to remember. So, all to say, it's been too long and we need to get out of the Middle East. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah I, I think you're right. And it is a win. I never know how much any of those Republicans saying they're against the war is actually worth because, yeah, what, what does it actually represent that they think? They think maybe that particular deployment is a bad thing. They just want to send them to some other country. They don't want to cut the budget. They don't want to stop using certain weapons. They like it, it always ends up being so shallow and surface level when they pretend that they're against a conflict. I say, and I'm sure many people in the audience probably agree, let's get out of all these places and then cut the budget massively because it's not needed. In fact, it's counterproductive to our safety. Yes. Um, anyway, really fast on this anniversary, in addition to, I agree with almost everything that you said about sort of how it's evolved over time. Seeing a couple of days ago, I saw in the news it was like, um, you know, Biden's talked about drawdowns of troops in Afghanistan and all that, but now they're saying, well, if we leave, there could be chaos. Well, where have we heard that before? Every single year since the beginning, and anyone saying that, I would love to hear how in 10 years or 20 years in the future, there won't be a threat of chaos. Chaos that we, of course, contributed to or in large part caused, but. Are we going to be in a better position at that point, five years from now, 10 years from now, 30 years from now? Or are we, as Francesca and I, are we gonna be broadcasting live streamed, you know, like TikTok 5.0 about Jeez. the 60th anniversary of the war in Iraq someday? Are we gonna be doing that? We might, we might. But anyway, really fast to give you a little bit of information, the total number of people who have died from the Iraq war, this is official counts, including soldiers, militants, police, contractors, journalists, humanitarian workers, and Iraqi civilians had reached at least 189,000 people, including at least 123,000 civilians. Obviously, the non-official counts believe that it is far more than that, especially for the civilians, but that's the official number. At the peak of the war back in 2007, a billion years ago, there were about 165,000 US military boots on the ground, thousands more in the region. And daily reports of traumatic brain injuries, amputations, active duty suicides. Today, there are still about 2,500 soldiers 18 years later, with many thousands more deployed in the region and thousands more US contractors also at risk and at work. And again, as we pointed out, how sick it is that we could have a military conflict where people who weren't born when it began could be serving active duty in it still. That is absurd. Any further thoughts, Francesca, before Oh my move God. On? <laughs> I mean, I have I have so many thoughts and I do think that it is, you know, I agree with you that it is mostly rhetoric that Republicans have hijacked, like they do a lot of things, and Trump hijacked. But Trump actually said he was against the war in Iraq. Now he did then say he would have, you know, taken more oil, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But it's important to know that the massive failure. It was not only immoral to go into Iraq, the way that the Trump, that the Bush administration did it was also a horrible failure, right? It didn't, you know, they they had no plan. That's why so many of the Bush officials are pariahs at this point. They're still you don't hear about John Ashcroft and Donald Rumsfeld, etc., right? Like um and and Condoleezza Rice for whatever. Like they they're largely in the shadows because of what a massive failure it was. That's true. There was a break 
There was a break in the Republican Party at that point. And, and it's the same way that someone like Jeb Bush didn't rise to the as a front runner. Obviously, he was a terrible candidate, number one, but he was also sort of representative of an old throwback neoconservative yeah. um, Republican Party that stupidly some moderate Republicans, if you can call them that, I'm sure Liz Cheney, are like pining away for the days when yeah. we had the neoconservatives. No, screw the neoconservatives. And Trump used that. Exactly, exactly, uh, yeah. exactly. So that's that is the danger. If Democrats can't understand, and look, Obama did pull out of Iraq, and of course, left some troops, and then was hammered in the media for it. Um, but if Democrats cannot claim the victory of we pulled out of Iraq, we will close and should close Guantanamo. We pull out of Afghanistan. You want to talk about the people who are trying to clean up Republican messes? We're doing that. The problem is they don't necessarily believe in all of that. Yeah. But again, like we cannot cede this territory, this anti-war territory, this you know, to the right wing because their version of it is isolationist and xenophobic and disgusting. And our version of it is internationalism, is like solidarity, is reparations for for Iraqis um, and is national sovereignty for countries around the yeah. world. Uh, great points. Um, and it'll be interesting to see in the next Republican primary how that split in the party works. Yeah. Um, even even if the split in some cases is more rhetorical than substantive, like Trump says things about the Iraq war, it doesn't actually reflect what he was saying at the time, um, nor does it reflect like some sort of basis for predictions about what he'll do in terms of foreign policy. Dude dropped a billion bombs once he became president. Yes. But he swore that he was, you know, anti military or all that. Anyway, I want to give Ken Klippenstein a little bit of credit because the dude can be brutal on social media. So there are a lot of people out there, including prominent people with big platforms who have been obviously attacking mask mandates, trying to create suspicion around vaccines. And he decided to point out that in some cases, they may not have the sort of rigorous fact checking process that they would have you believe. So author Naomi Wolf has gotten attention in recent weeks for comments decrying a totalitarian state brought about by lockdown policies. The Intercept's Ken Klippenstein posted on Twitter that he recently sent Wolf a direct message featuring Dr. John Sims, who was supposedly telling people if a vaccine is effective, then why do we need to pressure people to take it? Which is basically everything that Tucker Carlson has been saying for a long time. So he tweeted out a photo of his DM to Dr. Naomi Wolf of Dr. John Sims, and then her almost immediately tweeting it out herself, this photo of Dr. John Sims saying that quote, <laughs> at this point, yeah, no, Dr. John Sims does not exist. Johnny Sims does, and as his <laughs> name implies, he's less of a doctor and more of an adult film star. So <laughs> she spread it. Um, a lot of people picked up on this after Yashar Ali spread that she had uh, tweeted out and mentioned this is how top notch her vetting of information is that you can give her a doctored quote of a porn star and she'll just spread it because it says what she wants it to say. Oh my God. And it reached its peak of hilarity when Johnny Sins himself tweeted out what Ken Klippenstein did. <laughs> 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 oh my God. Guys, just do you know if the people that you follow on the internet are just like Facebook moms and dads yeah. who will uncritically share any meme they see mm -hmm. and just go with it? And John, is <laughs> your, do you have like an alter ego like in like Johnny Sliderola? Because I think that's what your alter ego is. There's John Iderola and there's Johnny Sliderola. I don't know what direction you're going with this. I'm worried though. If we could make um, a Wikipedia entry for Johnny Sliderola, I'd really appreciate it. Don't put that out there into the universe <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, so when someone said in the in the comments over on Twitch, uh, didn't expect to see Johnny Sins on TDR this morning. Yeah, most people didn't. But anyway, yeah, look. Is she that much worse in this respect than a lot of people? Perhaps not. A lot of people spread information without checking, either because they feel like they can trust the source or just for the same reason. It's convenient and it makes you feel good. But especially when you're talking about things so consequential, where literally lives will depend on what, what we view, you know, how we view vaccines, you should care enough to actually check into it. And anyway, it just 
he um a while back he got it was some senator I think to tweet out some ode to his uncle and it was just a photo of Jack Nicholson from a few good men and I didn't think he would be able to top that but I think he did with Johnny Sins. I would be curious to see what he could get Ted Cruz to spread in this area, considering Ted Cruz might be harder to trick because he obviously would have recognized Johnny Sins like immediately <laughs> based on his browsing habits. But anyway, Ken, great work. Ken Klippenstein, yes, he's like when extremely online people do extremely good things, and it doesn't often mm-hmm. happen. But exactly. yes, kudos. Welcome everyone to the weekly top 10 list this week, joined by Francesca Ferentini. As always, Francesca, how's it going? Good. Glad to have you here for the top 10 things we really wish you'd shut up about. Uh, not you specifically, you're very nice. Thank you for being here. Uh, but everybody, I just there's things that like if I could go from now until the day I die, never hearing about it again, assuming that was long enough span of time, I would be so happy, Francesca. No, mine's um, specifically know- about you. So mine oh, are me? all about things I wish you. That's what I thought the prompt was. So it's okay, just well, at some point with John Idarola. <laughs> okay. Maybe we'll see. This is going to be very personal. Um, I'm kidding. Mine are more broad, and uh, a couple are political. Some are. We'll see how that goes. We'll see if I get in trouble. Uh, my number one is going to. It's going to do two things. One, it's going to really piss some people off, and number two, it's going to get them to talk to me about the thing that, like, seriously, don't message me about this thing. I love you, but I don't want to hear about it. So we'll we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but anyway, thank you for being uh, members at tier two or tier three, getting access to this. Really do appreciate your support. And with that, Francesca, what's your number five? Um. Okay, so I got a message. Maybe they're watching, maybe they're not. Uh, mine are also like a little bit light, and I'm going to start with the lightest. Mm-hmm. And some usually a lot of men will be like, you know, you need to do this with your hair or your makeup, and you know, you need to be. And I'm like, uh huh, yeah, you need a life. And this was a, <laughs> oh, no. I think a, I think a woman who probably a younger woman who was like, your eyebrows are great, but you should laminate them, and they'll be amazing. So apparently, what people are doing, young women are doing, is straightening their eye. You get you like. Per, you straighten your eyebrow hairs so that they are like large and in charge and like even bushier and high. What I'm saying is this Gen Z, don't come for me. Just stop with your like <laughs> makeup trends and your eyebrow on fleek crap. I no one's, I'm not gonna laminate my eyebrows, but of course I immediately was like, tried to make them really bushy. And I'm like, I guess am I supposed <laughs> to do this now? And, I, and you might see me cuz I was like, okay, I guess I need to do this now. I guess this is a thing now, but just stop guys. If you're, we, we, you know, if you are a feminist, if you, you know, well, it's not about feminism. I'm not gonna bring feminism into this, the point is, mm-hmm. Don't spend all this money wow. laminating your goddamn eyebrows. That is dumb and silly. It's silly. I've never heard of that before. Like I no, just I had to Google you it. Run it through a laminating machine or something. Um, I laminate paper. I'm that kind of nerd. Um, but I no, have not my the my cat just like lick it up every morning. Like there you go. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Get your dog to. Just, um, I just yeah, hate. I don't know. I'm. I mean, I'm inclined to say that I don't know that there's a lot of Gen Z male trends, but the thing is, there probably are. I just don't know about them. And the, the obviously, you know, because I'm a guy on the internet, I don't get you know one one hundredth the comments about my physical appearance. But when I do, they're not specific about like here's a trend that can help you. They mostly assume that I'm lost. It's mostly just commenting on like things I've done to myself. So that's fun. <laughs> that's fun. Anyway. Yeah. Um, Okay, that's a good one. Wow, I like that. That is more personal. Yeah. I, oh God, now I'm wondering if I should have had. Some no, stuff I, I have think. other stuff Just too. Some about John. prank shows, basically. That's. I don't care. I'm not in. I'm not 15 anymore. Like it's not, and especially if it's on YouTube, it's not funny. Oh, and by the way, they're all fake. Every single one of them is fake. Back in the day, <laughs> some pranks were real. It might still be awful or whatever, but they were real. Now they're not. I watched a prank. No, this is my number five now. It wasn't gonna be my number five, but now it is my number five. I watched a video on Facebook of a guy who was like, 
his girlfriend had cheated on him with his brother. And so he told her with this like box with a cake in it and they were blindfolded. It was the fakest thing I've ever seen in my life. And it had like a billion views. Oh my God. I, I get that it's entertaining because somebody's getting one over on another, but they're not. It's totally fake. It's faker than professional wrestling. There's nothing real to it. So that apparently is now my number five. Don't talk to me about pranks or prank YouTubers. I'm not interested anymore. I like that, and 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 I hate every time you watch one and you're like, this could be. Oh, it's fake. It's fake. Definitely yeah. fake. And you yeah. catch yourself laughing, and then you're like, I am a simple person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's your number four? Uh, okay, number four. Um, air fryers, like. <laughs> Stop. Air fryers. I don't, why does this have to be a new like cooking fad? Just use your oven, get a better oven. <laughs> frying is bad for you anyway. This is like the vaping but isn't of- is air frying better for you? I don't, exactly. It's like Didn't the vape- we talk about it? No, because vaping was the, the better for you than smoking. And then that had a bunch of unintended That's slash true. very foreseeable consequences. I bet you that air frying is gonna be just as bad. Something something about the way the air does a thing. I don't eat meat, so I don't like, and also when I did eat meat, I like baked chicken. It's fine, Make mm -hmm. learn how to make a good steak, Do use a grill. I don't know, a fr air fryer, it's another appliance. George Foreman. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's a whole that's a whole other, he used to be a Black Panther. Um, But <laughs> yeah, there's so, but yeah, I'm just like, why do I have to jump on this trend? Look, I just got an instant pot, which by the way has changed mm -hmm. my life, but I don't want an air fryer. It takes up too much space <laughs> oh and I don't talk to me about that. <laughs> this is just, don't tell me about Catholicism. I found a different religion. That's all you just went through the whole religious no, thing. No. That's all it was. No, don't because- Don't tell me about this sect, I've already got a sect. No, yes. An instant well, pot is an air fryer, it's no, not. It's but it's not. It's the same thing. Well, what does culturally. it do? What can I? What can, if I'm a vegetarian? What can I do with a, an air fryer? I don't know. You get air fry vegetables, I assume. Now, look. Let let me be clear. I don't own an air fryer. I do own an instant pot, and they are awesome. Even though I don't use it very often because I don't cook. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't want to hear about any any trend with. Food th I'll get it eventually. It took like three years to get an instant pot, so I, I do agree with but you. But all of these things are but like they're a, just so they're so like first world, like not first world, but oh, just yeah. like you know, people around the world make delicious things without instant pots, without air yes. fryers, without blenders, without you know food processors. You know, you mash it up. Like I used to, I live when I lived in Argentina, which I will talk about all the time. I used to make pesto, and I would just chop. You yeah. just chop a lot. You, you chop know, a lot. Just chop a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, my number four, it might put me in trouble, but I'm just gonna say it. Um, I don't talk to me about Julian Assange. And you might think, well, no, but he deserves a pardon. <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the substance of any of it. I'm there with you. I was years ago, but the conversation's exactly the same as it was three years ago, and I don't want to hear about it anymore. Again, this isn't about the substance of any of it. I'm just done hearing about it every two weeks. Don't there are lie. Some people, there are some people who literally the only thing in politics they care about is whatever bullshit about Julian Assange. And I don't understand that being the only thing you're interested in politics. And again, it's not about the substance and it's not about whether he once did a good thing or whatever. Sometimes bad unfair things happen to people who are also Horrible, and he's horrible. Not on that substance, but generally horrible. And um, I, I understand that based on some of the work that he did a billion years ago, uh, a bunch of progressives feel like somehow he's our guy. He's not. He doesn't care if every progressive in America dies tomorrow. He doesn't care if we ever get Medicare. He ain't a leftist. He ain't an American progressive. He ain't any of that. And again, that has nothing to do with whether he should be pardoned or extradited or whatever. I'm not talking about that. I just don't want to invest any more of my soul into a person who doesn't give up about you or me or Francesco or anybody. He doesn't care about any of that. So I would Fucking love to never hear again. First just of all, I didn't know we could swear on out this. Somewhere. Can we? We can't. I love you. Oh, wait, I love but this you, is John. Not live. Can we bleep it? 
Okay, good. Sorry, Cassie or Alex. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I sorry. Want I just want to say like, you're interrupting me, saying that I love you, John, and this is why I love you, your show, your POV. Like, yeah, yeah. It's enough with Assange. Like, Homeboy has done a lot of bad things. Uh, hello, back channel to all of the Russia stuff. But I'm just a Russia gator, you know, slash believe in reality and like read many different sources other than Glenn Greenwald. And you know, so yeah, you're right. Uh, Assange had a one one good thing, you know, Chelsea Manning and getting that information out was absolutely wonderful. I cried the day that Chelsea was was pardoned, um, and uh, I believe that she is a stalwart of her cause and and remains that way. Assange, not so much. Yeah. Not gonna no, that extend that to Assange. Now that doesn't mean that then bad unfair things get to be done to that person. I just at a certain point after making clear that I want fair just things to happen, get to check out at a certain point and care about a lot of other people who are suffering that are also not terrible. There's a yeah. lot of injustices in the world. Diversify a bit. Anyway, that's my number four. That's Maybe so good. That's so good. I I wish I would have put more thought into this. Oh my god. Um okay. I like Elon Musk reply guys. <laughs> I don't I know I don't want to hear from you anymore. Shut up. You're saving up for a space tank or a moon truck or whatever the <laughs> hell it's called. You're going to waste all of your money on that uggo POS and you're 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 like cool dude i i get that you're investing in gamestop so that you can then like buy a moon truck and like bite lick off of the elon musk lollipop like stop you're not a billionaire you're never going to be a billionaire replying to elon musk tweets by fawning over him is not going to make you any closer to a billionaire he is trash he is up his own ass. He is not paying his fair share of taxes. Didn't shut down the Tesla manufacturing sites when COVID was outbreaking. The guy thinks he is a gift from God and he's not. Uh, he is rapidly becoming a just a carbohydrate based um, like weirdo Grimes, you know, fanboy, you know, Joe Rogan smokes too much weed. I don't know what. Oh my God, he's yeah, he's a douchebag. Just stop. So I don't want to hear anything about SpaceX. I don't care about your rocket launch. This is a rocket launch. This is a rocket. This is a rocket. I don't I, care. Well, I don't look, care. Look, oh I God. like the rockets. John, I just don't no. want him to be involved in it all. Yes, I don't want him <laughs> to be involved in it. Every time I talk about space, every time I talk about Mars, man, I got hate when I talked about Mars on the on the Bituation Room. I'm sorry. I believe in with Bernie. I'm with Bernie. We need to solve the crises on Earth. We need to help people mm -hmm. on Earth. So stop with all the Elon Musk worship. I don't want to hear it. That's a great one. Whew, okay, uh, my number three is uh, because I inserted YouTube prank shows at number five. I got to uh, reconfigure this. Uh, my number three is going to be uh, the Royals. Originally, it was going to be my number five <laughs> because apparently I do want to talk about it a little bit, I guess. But now I think I'm good. <laughs> I think we got past that bit and now I can go back to not caring about it and hopefully not hearing about it. And can I also lump Piers Morgan into the Royals thing? I, those are pretty much inseparable anyway. Yeah, um, other than liking that one couple, I, I don't care about any of it. It's stupid. I think that it, like if you're not gonna just get rid of them right now, just don't have it continue after. Like nobody should become the next Duke or King. Just have it be, you know, as long as they're alive, you have it. And then once they're gone, that's it. I think that would be great. Um, there are good people in the world that you could focus your attention on. Uh, they're not Elon Musk, but there are good people other than the royals that have actually earned, hopefully, your respect or admiration or whatever. Um, yeah. So I'm sick of the royals. Don't talk to me about the royals anymore. <laughs> What's your number two? I agree, they should die. Um, number two is more specifically, well, no, they should die out. Die, I mean, you know, like, you know, naturally. They don't naturally. Like, she should be, oh. Elizabeth should be the last. I totally sure. agree with you. And once they were completely unwilling to, like, honestly engage in what I thought was a very honest conversation vis a vis Oprah um, with Meghan Markle and Harry, then it's like, I don't care anymore. Yeah, guys, yep. just go away. Just go away. Um, 
Number two is more specifically about John Iderola, but it's also about me and it's about just generally not understanding this world or universe. <laughs> what? I don't want to hear anything about the Avengers. I knew it. I or knew it. Justice I League. Oh, Justice I don't talk about <laughs> Avengers. I don't care. They're all the same. Wonder Woman, Batman, Hulky, Thor, Hulky. with the with the with the Aqua <laughs> Dude, and the, the sugar, pew pew pew. <laughs> like, no, I'm sorry. I, I like the <sighs> comics. It's fine if you want to read comics. That seems cool to me. The movies are uh, just overdone. Too much CG. No, nothing interesting about plot. Scarlett Johansson can't act, so I don't even care what? about Black Widow. Don't she cannot what? act? ScarJo is She's number number one, two point one. Lost I just translation. I'm not a I'm not an action movie person. I do I did like the Black Panther for many different reasons, but not the the comic book action part of it or the hero worship. I don't like superhero stuff. I I've never even seen all the Spider Men. I watched the 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 Spider Man um, Spider Verse into the Spider Verse. That was excellent, but that was like for what? so many other reasons it was excellent. But I just don't care about saving the planet with your pew pew. <sighs> I should have known that you'd put that on there. First of all, it it offends me so much. I know. That, so here, there's two layers to this. The first layer is it offends me so much that you lumped in all of that DC stuff with Marvel. But I also know that me being bothered by the distinction between that is probably another thing that you don't want to hear about. Because <laughs> to you, there's no distinction between those no. two things. But there is a distinction. Anyway, no, I'm not. So Avengers are better. Is Black yes. Panther's with the Avengers, or is he, he is, with the yes. just? Oh, okay. He's with the Avengers. Where's um, Spider Man? Spider Man is now with Marvel. It used to be an independent Sony thing, but now he's with Marvel for a couple movies. Anyway, I just yes, yeah, some of them are too CGI-ish, and and that's generally when they lose me. But there's a lot of interesting writing, and I find. I like the idea of heroism and people actually rising above themselves and caring about something and you know all of that. There's some there's a lot of stuff about patriotism and kind of quasi fascist stuff that I don't necessarily like, but yeah. there's some good political messages too. And I like heroic sacrifice, it's my favorite thing in movies, so they give you a lot of that as well. So uh so screw you. And rom -coms I rom coms have heroic sacrifice, dude. I like some rom coms actually, that might surprise you, but I do. Anyway. Um Okay. Independence Day had heroic sacrifice. That was it. Didn't uh, have to, I cry movie. every time that now crazy person flies into the spaceship. <laughs> yeah, I do every <laughs> single time. Anyway, uh, my number two is I our first crossover. Anything by or about Elon Musk? <laughs> I don't care. He is. He should be remembered throughout time. For only one thing, everything else should fade away, like the dust should blow it away. <laughs> As the biggest waste of some apparent talent ever, combined with him being given tons of resources, they pretend that he's self-made. Self-made? What are you talking about? His family's rich, but he could do apparently a lot. They literally rock, they send rockets up and stuff. And the Didn't, dude, wasn't he born on a mine, like some yeah, kind of precious like metal mine, mine, in South Africa? <laughs> He did it all from his garage. No, you crazy idiot. Anyway, he can make some stuff. It's not as good as they say. Tesla has a lot of manufacturing problems and stuff like that, let alone all the labor problems and everything. And then he made a few things. And other than that, he's like the worst person on the planet. I might despise him on a personal level more than I do Donald Trump. I'm not sure, I'm still working that out. But he's such a waste of time, Oh my God. And of all of the people, for some other people on the internet to make liking them their entire personality, I don't get it with Elon Musk. Choose any random person, be a Taylor Swifty or whatever, be super into Cardi yes. B. That's better. That's so much better. Um, God, Elon Musk is such a goddamn stupid, oversensitive waste of time. <sighs> anyway, what's your number one? Okay, um, number one is. Um, Sort of the bad faith use of the word woke 
Um, so and like wokeism, saying wokeism, which is now a big right wing talking point. Oh, the wokeism, you know, and uh, the wokeism of the left and the blah, blah blah blah, the cultural Marxist wokeism. Wokeism is also sort of a term used by, you know, bad faith lefties who basically. Yeah. Are trying to say that they don't like identity politics and neoliberal or centrist identity politics, but end up just using shorthand woke and ultimately basically just throw people of color under the bus and like have no race analysis because they just got hip to socialism two years ago and now are all about class reductionism. So I hate the way that people say wokeism when they're it actually borderlines being kind of racist. And no matter whether you're on the right or the left, it just feels like you're throwing the Black Lives Matter movement and feminism and women's movements, um, LGBTQ people under the bus. Mm. Uh, and you're buying into a lot of the BS that like somehow those movements are dividing us when they're absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. This is one example of a lot of ways that the idea of something being able to be super simplified seems pure in a way that doesn't make it reflective of the actual world. We are not, we are not simple. Like this isn't physics. We're not just billiard balls that you can easily calculate how they bounce. It's complex. This is yeah. a complex world. You need to understand it, even if it makes you uncomfortable a little bit or whatever. Um, so I agree. That's a great one. I originally had. Not quite that, but something akin to it. But you're 100 percent right. Um, that's a good. That's a good number one. My number one. I I worry that it's a bit repetitive because I I feel in a way that I can't express that it's the same thing as Elon Musk. <laughs> but don't talk to me. And I'm I'm talking to the internet. I'm talking to one or two specific people at our company. Don't talk to me about Bitcoin ever. God damn it, <laughs> ever. <laughs> I hate it so much. I crypto. Now, there's some reasons I hate it that are more about me. Like I don't understand it. Mm-hmm. And I've I've gotten to the point where I think that everyone who says they do, do is lying, which probably again says more about me than about them. But um I, even if I did eventually understand it, stop. Seriously stop. And that now apparently you're also wrecking the environment, which I hadn't really known about. To so stop, I, I hate the fact that on the podcast app I'm on, uh, or it's on YouTube, I hear about Bitcoin, the best money we've ever had. No, no, it's it's just it's best case scenario, just money. And it's don't talk to me about mining. It's stupid. It doesn't mean anything. And I really honestly think <laughs> that all of the people who get super into this. Like I think they all suspect like I do that it's a big scam, but they think that they can get the better of it. I think that this is yes. all a big pyramid scheme of people trying to grab the pyramid, or climb up it. And as they go up it, they like shout down, hey, this is awesome, come up with me. I think that's basically what it is. But yes. no matter what it is, I hate it, I don't wanna hear about it. And with Bitcoin, I wanna throw in and Elon Musk, I feel like it's the same thing. Also, NFTs, whatever those are, it's all like this is part of establishing a cyberpunk dystopia is we've come up with a bunch of (laughs) digital shit that doesn't mean anything. And it's just a big waste of time, energy, both human energy and literal electricity um, to create fun distractions for super rich people. And the the whole thing, I get that I'm ignorant and that's laced throughout this. Um, but the whole thing just frustrates me to no end. You're just mad, bro, because like my Bitcoin just went up a little bit. Uh, so like, yeah, don't be a hater. No, it is. It's a gateway. It's a gateway to more Bitcoin. Is gateway to more Bitcoin. It's very bad. It is. I know people who've gotten super obsessed with crypto and just like that's all they do. That is their life. Um, it it needs to be regulated. It is also, yeah, you're talking about like giant servers that house all of the like mining, like it's it's just so black mirror and so awful. And you're absolutely right. It's like people think that they're gonna make some money and they know it's not an okay thing, but they're just gonna do it anyway. And until and it like have. finally gets regulated. No, 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 and, and they have. They made big money and people that's good for money. them, I'm glad. But um, oh, I, I don't wanna hear about it either, so I as totally I, agree. Yeah, as I said at the very beginning of this, 
I'm very worried that you're going to watch this video and think, oh no, John just needs to have it explained to him. No, I don't, and I don't want, don't message me. You know what should have been on this list? And it's sort of similar. I don't want to hear anything more about the last season of Game of Thrones and how you don't get why I was able to enjoy it on some level. And you think that you, two things, you think one, that you are capable of convincing me after the fact to have not enjoyed it. Or two, that if that was possible, that that's a thing I would open myself up to. Yes, please, logic me into not having fun anymore. Why would I do that? Please don't mess with <laughs> me. No, I mean, you're wrong. You're wrong about about the last season, but you're entitled to your wrong opinion. And I would Thank never you. take your bad opinion from you, John. Thank you, I appreciate that. Okay, well, anyway, we gotta cut this so that we can go and have a conversation about Marvel and Hulky and all that, but anyway. <laughs> Hulky. as always, thank you. <laughs> Hulky, you. you know his name is the Hulk. Anyway, um, and thank you to everybody watching this uh, for being tier two uh, or tier three members. Um, and I understand some of you may be really into these things. Again, just like she said, I'm so happy for you to be into it. I just don't <laughs> want to hear about it anymore. And uh, with that, we'll see you next time. Virtually everyone in America is curious to find out what lies in the future for Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I say virtually everyone because there's one person who doesn't want us to be focusing on that apparently, and that is Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Despite that, and with full respect for the representative, we are gonna talk about it and speculate a bit though, because I'm really curious. So we are very lucky to be joined for the first time on the show by the political correspondent for Insider, Tina Svondelis. Welcome to the Damage Report. Thank you, thanks for having me. Uh, very glad to have you here. Uh, you recently did a write up about a conversation with the representative about some of the, the potential paths that people have speculated about. Um, how did that conversation come to be? Well, as you said, everyone wants to know what she's going to do in her future. There's always rumblings about whether she will run against Chuck Schumer, whether she'll run for president in 2024. And meanwhile, she's just very busy doing things on a daily basis and is kind of annoyed at the noise. Like, I'm sure she's flattered. Um, but so we wanted to talk to her about this because people are always curious. Um, and so my colleague Warren Rojas actually was at the Capitol, stopped her, had this really wonderful interview with her where she, uh, which we disclose in, in our story just about how she doesn't want it to be just about herself. That she mm-hmm. believes it's about, a mo- if you're progressive, you're about a movement, you're not about one person saving the world. Um, and so she kind of favors that dialogue over everyone wanting her to be the savior of the world. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and obviously, I mean, even if you just wanted her to have more power, having more progressives in the house would certainly help that. Did she mention any particular names that she was focused on that are either currently running or might be running that she would want people to focus on in particular? She did not. Um, I would say this was a very kind of broad overview of her political future, which um, my people are interested in, political reporters, our editors, etc. So we kind of just wanted to get it out there into into the air. Um, I do know that she's focusing on issues um, that she really cares about. Obviously, she cares about climate change. She's um, there's a bill introduced last week, I believe, with for infrastructure and creating um, clean energy jobs. Um, the minimum wage is hugely important to her right now. So um, she did not get into the specifics of the actual political races she's Mm -hmm. looking at. Um, But we see that almost daily with her emails, with her fundraising emails. There's, you know who she's supporting, you know what causes she's supporting, you know what she cares about for the week. Now, um, so I'm of course curious, like there's several things that obviously she's gonna be working on. In terms of, does she give you any indication of what she thinks the next big focus of the Biden White House should be? Uh, She did not, but as I said, she's pushing very much so uh, clean energy jobs, climate, she needs that. She was on the, um, there's a unity task force with uh, former Secretary of State John Kerry. And that's great for her because he's our climate person right now in our country. And she has immediate access to him. So I think that is gonna be huge. She already has, you know, the influence of being herself. And now she has like a direct line to someone who's supposed to create a lot of change uh, for climate. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, in terms of the speculation, uh, you mentioned a few possibilities that she could yeah. uh, challenge Chuck Schumer, that she could run for president. In theory, she could go for some sort of leadership position in the House. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, she's not, you know, talking about those possibilities much. Is she ruling out any of them? Is she saying clearly, no, I'm not going to be challenging Chuck Schumer? That's obviously a closer race than some of these others. Yeah, that's what's interesting. Um, she has not been quoted saying definitely, no, I'm staying where I'm at. I- 
you know, she that's the best answer for any politician is to not say yes or no. So she's not really saying no. Um, we could see something. I do think a Chuck Schumer race would, would be difficult. And he's got, you know, he knows how to fundraise just as she does. I think she, she, she's got more, I, I forget at this point, but they're both very good at fundraising. So that would mm-hmm. be a really tough race. And as you've seen, I don't know if you've seen on Twitter, anytime you talk about 2024, people are so mad. Like they're so mad that you even bring up 2024. <laughs> they're like, I'm, I have PTSD, I cannot deal with this yet. Sure. Um, and th- that's definitely happening where it, people are just angry at this point about any speculation. We write a lot of stories about the vice president potentially running. Mm-hmm. Some people are mad about that. So I feel like, you know, we'll see what happens in a yeah. couple of years or months, essentially. I, look, I, I get it. It was a long election. It felt like a long time. But I also remember the 2016 election. And that doesn't feel like it was that long ago. No. The four years is four years, but four years does pass. So yeah, it does. Um, and in terms of the, the Chuck Schumer, whether she runs or not, there is some conversation about how she, how the prospect of a potential primary race could be affecting him. And you yes. know, a lot of his recent moves are interpreted through that lens. Like if he's pushing <laughs> Biden to cancel fifty thousand dollars, would he have been doing that if AOC was still a yes. bartender? What well, what are your thoughts about all of that? We did directly ask people that question. Essentially, um, people who worked for Chuck Schumer, like we talked to a former legislative director in our story, and he did not believe that. Um, he he said that it was more reflective of the caucus that Democrats are more progressive now in in his caucus, and so he has to listen to them. Um, and that it's not just her and her everything. Um, I, I think that it is. He what they say is that it's a collective moving to the left, and that he's trying to listen, and that he's a smart guy. He knows. But he needs to go to the left for whatever for political purposes for everything else. So he he's listening. I don't know if it's necessarily just her. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. And there, there's one other topic I wanted to ask you about. So uh, we've talked about several of the possibilities for the representative that she could go for some higher office or that she could stay in her current office. Of course, the third option would be that she could not even stay in her current office. And she has at least once before hinted that, especially considering. I mean, she must face about as much harassment and death threats as anyone in politics these days. Um, that's a lot. And that in theory, she might not see her future, including political office. Did that come up at all in the conversation? It's a nod, but as you said, I mean, we've, we've heard her talk on Instagram Live about January 6th or even before that she has had threats before. Um, and it's really scary. She's had to use some money to beef up security at certain town halls. Um, but the thing is that she could still have the power even if she was not in her position. That's another thing that we learned in the story. We know that people wanted to hear her talk. She has Twitter, she has her Instagram lives where there's 150,000 or more people. She has millions of followers on Twitter. She can send out an email and raise how much for Texas, millions of dollars for Texas when they needed True. it. So even if she was not in the house, I still think she can do whatever she wants. Exactly. Yeah. And to your audience, to our audience, I don't know anyone watching this, which side you lay on. If you're curious about the speculation or if you lean more with the representative that we should be focusing on other races. Um, here at the Damage Report, we're going to do both because we actually do a show every day. And we have time to fill. But anyway, um, uh, appreciate you joining us, Tina, uh, to talk about your work and to help speculate. Um, you know, We find it as entertaining as, as you. And so uh, thank you as always, and we hope that we speak to you again soon. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.